Welcome to Black Hat Windows 2K Security, held February 14th through the 15th, 2001, in Las Vegas, Nevada. The following videotape was recorded live at the conference and produced by the Sound of Knowledge Incorporated. This is videotape number K1, the first keynote address, Researching Secrets. All here. There's more of you than we expected, which is fantastic for a uh, first show of its kind. Um, I started uh, this Black Hat briefing's uh, Win 2K because uh, in the July show, many of you know it's, uh, it's pretty full, and a lot of the topics started to tend toward Windows, and I didn't want to turn that show into just a giant Microsoft uh, technology show. So we spun off and started this show, and it looks like there's actually enough interest. Uh, <laughs> I hate configuring Microsoft products, but I use them all over the place, and there's enough weird options that I know there's security implications in every checkbox. And uh, I'm sure you guys face all the same problems, so I thought it was time to do something about it and have a show. Uh, you can bring up the water after, please. Um, so that said, um, we got together a panel of speakers, and if we could, everybody here who's a, a speaker, if you could stand up. I'd like to identify you and say that it's, it's thanks to these people that we'll uh, be having a show today. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for... <coughs> yes. <coughs> Without these people, none of this would be possible. So I just want to make that uh, clear to everybody. Also, it's an interactive process. I like to make sure that there's kind of an exchange of uh, information here. It's not these are the teachers and you're the students and you're not supposed to ask any questions. It's kind of more of a Socratic method where I want you to interact with the teachers and try to pick their brains for as much information as you can. Um, that's what they're here for. It's not meant to be a big serious uh, academic exercise. Okay, um, let me give you a couple of updates. Um, there's one change to the program. Kate Bourne, who is scheduled uh, for tomorrow, um, is going to swap places with David Litch... Uh, Kate Bourne isn't listed tomorrow. She's supposed to be in David Litchfield's spot tomorrow. She's now speaking in David Litchfield's spot today. Uh, David is sick, and we're going to hope he's going to recover in time to speak tomorrow. So put Kate Bourne in for David Litchfield today, and you'll be up to date. Um, <clears throat> right before we started, the wireless connection is up, and people are successfully SSHing through uh, checking mail and such. So as long as you're within uh, wireless distance of the front desk, uh, you can DHCP down an address and away you go. There's no special scope IDs or anything. You just can go. Um, also this evening, we have a catered reception um, where you get to drink on me and meet each other and uh, socialize. Um, I've opened it up to anybody's spouse, so if you'd like to, for Valentine's Day, bring your significant other, and uh, that way you don't have to you know, cause matrimonial uh, distress if you want to hang out with your friends also at the same time. Um, and finally, before we get going, um, <clears throat> you might have noticed the real media server was down for a while at Black Hat. That was because I purchased a new server from Dell Computers that uh, didn't actually exist at the time. Uh, though their marketing page said it did. So we've got the server, the speeches from all the past shows are up online, and I've just added uh, about half of the European shows and all of last July's shows. Um, so if you'd like to review past talks, please uh, feel free to download them, they're all free. And we'll add the remaining uh, European show talks uh, when I get back uh, to Seattle. And then in the future, we've got a couple of things up our sleeves. Um, we've got a, a site redesign, uh, we're re-encoding a lot of the video. Um, we also are going to be setting up a new mailing list. Uh, we don't have a mailing list th currently, but there's a lot of noise out there on a lot of the security mailing lists. So we're trying a new concept in mailing lists, which I won't go into right now for fear of competitors. But uh, it will be a free list, but it should have some excellent content, and it should be up before July. So um, if you've attended this show, you'll get a, an email about it letting you know that we have a, a new mailing list with excellent security content and discussions on it. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Jim Bamford. I had the uh, privilege of meeting Jim at the uh, National Information System Security Conference in Washington, D.C. last year. And um, 
if you guys know about that show, it's put on a joint show by NIST and the NSA. So it's full of spooks. And um, if you've read James' book on the Puzzle Palace, it's all about the NSA. So there's a little bit of tension in the room. Because here was the guy that was spilling the beans of the agency that always tries to keep everything secret. And uh, he's got some fantastic war stories. And, uh, and one of them was uh, there was a, a person at the NSA that tried to get his book stopped, um, stopped being printed at the printing press. And uh, it didn't work. And years later, James uh, ran into the person and asked him, you know, hi, how come you uh, tried to prevent my book from being published? And the, the guy from the NSA was really cool about it. He said, apparently, um, well, you know, at the, at the time, it seemed like a really good idea. So not anymore. Times have changed. And he has a new book out now called Body of Secrets. Uh, we hope to have it in time for the show, but uh, its release date publicly has been pushed back. It won't come out until the middle of next month. And it's basically an update on what's been happening in the NSA for the last 20 years. Um, so it touches on Echelon. It touches on a lot of new technologies. So with that said, James is going to speak a little bit about what does it take to research a secret organization, or how, what are some of the methodologies? Why, you know, what happens when you decide you just want to investigate a spy agency? So I'd like to introduce uh, Jim Bamford and let him take it away. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks, Jack, for uh, having me here. I guess it's rather appropriate since I was uh, NSA's first black hat after I did the Puzzle Palace. They weren't very happy with me. But I never worked for NSA, and um, uh, I was a researcher, writer. I graduated from law school and didn't want to practice law, so I went into writing. And um, nobody had ever done a book on NSA, so I thought it was a good topic to write about. And I spent three years on it. and. It's still the only book on NSA uh, until at the end of April, my new book, uh, Body of Secrets, is coming out, which will take a, a new look at uh, the agency basically throughout the Cold War until present. Um, writing about NSA is, uh, is a real trip because, um, I mean, they not only do they not give you any help, they give you as much hindrance as possible. Um, when, um, I mean, if, people here don't know much about NSA. It's the um, principal agency of the U.S. government that's involved in eavesdropping uh, worldwide and, and uh, breaking codes, as well as making the U.S. Uh, secure encryption system. Um, for many years it had the, uh, it was known as uh, NSA, the Na uh, Never Say Anything or, or uh, uh, No Such Agency. And then uh, when my book came out, they were saying it now stands for Not Secret Anymore. Which, uh, which wasn't really true. I mean, they had a few secrets left. My book basically got into a lot of the historical areas of NSA. It didn't get into the technical areas too much, um, although the, um, I, I had to discuss how they actually go about their um, uh, signals intelligence and so forth. Um, one of the problems with writing about NSA is that uh, a lot of other people that you're dealing with don't know anything about it, especially back then when I was doing the Puzzle Palace. Uh, after it came out, I'd go into um, uh, bookstores, and uh, occasionally they'd, uh, I'd say, you know, do you have the Puzzle Palace in here? And occasionally people would come up, and uh, the clerk would come back and say, yeah, we have uh, copies, and I'd say, I didn't see it there. And they'd say, well, it's over there in the puzzle section. <laughs> so uh, uh, even Senator Bradley, I was on a, a speaking tour, and uh, he was uh, sharing this card to the studio we went to to speak, he was going to speak about the economy and I was going to speak about NSA. And in the car he said, uh, what's your book about? And I said, it's about NSA, the National Security Agency. And he said, what's that? <laughs> so um, I ended up explaining to the senior senator from New Jersey what, um, what NSA was. And then when we got on the, on the TV show, he did his uh, thing on the economy first and then I, I came on and the host asked me, it was his first question, how secret is NSA? And I just couldn't resist it. I said, even Senator Bradley said he'd never heard of it. And he got very angry. He, 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 uh, <laughs> he didn't wait for me to finish. He left uh, before I finished and took his own car back. So uh, the next day his press secretary called me up and said that wasn't very nice. And I said, well, uh, you know, he's a senator. He's supposed to know these things. And the press secretary said that was a, sort of a hit below the belt, and I said, look, a hit below the belt would have been if I said uh, he confused it with the NBA instead of the NSA. <laughs> so, uh, um, 
But hopefully Senator Bradley now that he's, he spent, or former Senator Bradley now that he spent time on the Intelligence Committee knows a little bit more about it than I do. Um, one thing about uh, doing research on NSA, it, it's sort of like being a hacker in a sense. Uh, I mean, you have to have that mindset in order to do this because it's not something you just go down to the local library and pull out some information on it. You have to be creative uh, in uh, investigative research. And uh, that meant uh, looking into a lot of different areas that nobody had ever looked into before, finding areas that had uh, never been explored before in terms of uh, information. Like I said, NSA wasn't going to be any help at all, so I had to look elsewhere for information. One of the problems, uh, NSA is excluded from the Freedom Information Act, basically. I mean, there's a thing called Public Law 8636, subsection 6, which I can recite in my sleep uh, because I've gotten so many letters back that cite it. Basically, it says uh, NSA doesn't have to give you anything uh, if it doesn't want to, and they don't usually want to. So. Uh, I had to find a way around that. Uh, I found a thing called the NSA Newsletter, which is published every month that had been published since the agency was created in 1952. And the newsletter is fairly chatty. They've got the lunch menu for the next week and the local golf club scores and things like that. Uh, but it's an NSA document. And um, inside uh, every issue, uh, right up until the last issue, which was uh, uh, last October, um, there was a little paragraph that said, the contents of this newsletter must be kept within the small circle of NSA employees and their families. Um, so if I requested the, the document under the FOIA, if I said, I want all your back issues from 1952 to present, they just say, uh, under, under the response, they'd say, under public, <coughs> excuse me, under public ID 636, we don't have to give it to you. Well, that little paragraph uh, struck a bell when I read it. And, uh, um, uh, one of the few areas my law school background gave me a little bit of help, I think, was uh, noticing when it said, um, and their families. Well, because they said, and their families, NSA, according to my argument, basically waived 8636. They basically said uh, they're opening it up to a, a body of the public, family members, you know, um, uh, somebody's cousin, somebody's brother. Um, and if you've opened it up to that member, uh, that, that little uh, segment of the public, in essence, you've opened it up to the world. And that was my argument. And it, basically, I won. I settled out of court, sort of, with NSA. I, uh, they sent me, uh, initially, a few newsletters, and they thought that would sort of satisfy me. And then I said, what I want are all the newsletters uh, uh, back to 1952, which was about 5,000 pages. So f they finally agreed, and they sent me the newsletters, but they redacted them. They took out all the names. And I said, well, if you haven't taken the names out of the copies you've given to family members, you can't take them out of the copies you gave to me. So again, we had another fight. And this time, um, uh, they asked me to come down to NSA for a meeting with the general counsel to sort of settle this thing. And they basically asked me what I wanted in order to keep out of court. So I said, I want a tour of the agency. I want the entire internal structure clean names and titles. I want interviews with officials. I just, it was actually Valentine's Day, uh, 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 same day as today when, uh, when I did this. So I thought uh, maybe this would be my nice Valentine. They'll give it to me. I was only expecting a few items on my wish list there, but they said, OK, we'll give you everything you want. And I agreed to drop the, um, uh, I agreed not to bring a lawsuit. So um, what they didn't know was at the same time, I had also found somebody else who had a whole collection of these newsletters. Like a pack rat, he just kept them for years and years, and he gave me full access to them, so I wasn't really giving away anything. And uh, they gave me the, uh, the tour, so I was the first sort of outsider, certainly the first journalist ever given a, uh, a tour of NSA, and they gave me interviews with people, and I got the whole internal structure stretch stretching back five years. So that was one way of using the FOIA um, uh, sort of creatively, even though um, NSA is basically excluded. You, uh, I found, a, in essence, a loophole that gave me uh, uh, you know, a ton of information. It gave me um, all the newsletters. Uh, I let them keep the names deleted, but everything else in the newsletters uh, they gave me, they gave me a tour and interviews and everything else. Um, that was one area of uh, success. One other area in terms of the Freedom Information Act. Um, 
if you can't get something from NSA, a lot of times you might be able to get it from some other agency because other agencies have similar documents. It's more difficult now than when I did the Puzzle Palace, but uh, the Justice Department had conducted a huge investigation into NSA. It was totally secret, very, very secret. Uh, very few people knew that the Justice Department investigated NSA for um, eavesdropping, illegal eavesdropping. It stemmed out of an investigation done by, uh, in the mid-1970s, done by a thing called the Rockefeller Commission Report, which looked into the intelligence community. And they found some indications that NSA had been eavesdropping illegally on U.S. citizens and other people um, with, uh, without any warrants, which is what the law requires. So the Justice Department decided to, to do their own investigation, and it was the first time in history that the Justice Department ever investigated a, a, an entire U.S. agency as a defendant, where they actually came into the agency and they read senior officials their Miranda, war uh, a Miranda warning and, um, and interrogated them. And it was a full-blown investigation, although it was kept totally secret. Um, Eventually, in the end, they decided not to, they, they found numerous grounds to, to bring charges, but they decided against it in the end because of, uh, uh, it would have been impossible to take this to court because of all the secrets that would have had to come out during a, during a trial. Anyway, I had heard rumors that there had been this investigation, so I submitted a, a Freedom Information Act request to the Justice Department. And uh, again, it was just, you know, you just throw it out there and who knows what happens. Maybe it'll turn something up, maybe it won't. Uh, about nine months later, I got this thick document from the Justice Department, and it was their, basically their whole investigation. Uh, and they had redacted some of the material, but I was really quite amazed. Um, and at one point, because I'd gone to NSA numerous times just to um, talk to them about different things, uh, uh, I brought the document with me because I f figured they, you know, they knew about it, and I sh showed it to them. I said, "Look, if you guys can re release all this stuff, then you know, why can't you release these other things I'm asking for?" And the guy I showed it to, his eyes got huge. You know, like, "Where did you get that thing?" And it still had "top secret Umbra," which was the code word and all that on it and everything. So he was uh, sort of freaking out there, looking at it. And uh, I said, "Well, the Justice Department gave it to me." Well, NSA had no idea the Justice Department had released it to them. Uh, release it to me. Uh, the Justice Department had the philosophy that um, um, people write in for the uh, uh, results of closed investigations. If I wanted Al, um, you know, uh, some uh, uh, Al Capone or some you know notorious figure, they would uh, have to release it to me. And um, the problem is that they don't send it to Al Capone to ask his permission first. Uh, and they don't send it to defendants that are, you know, uh, have been convicted and the investigation is over. They don't ask their permission. So that was the same philosophy. They weren't going to go to NSA and ask their permission before they release it to me. So NSA had no idea about the release of the document. Um, as a result, NSA tried to get the document back. They went to the Attorney General, Attorney General Civiletti, and said, Bamford's got this document. You've got to get it back from him. Well, Civiletti was the guy who released it to me, so I mean, he wasn't about to get it back from me. Uh, and he, they just ignored, it was Bobby Ray Inman who was director, they just ignored uh, Bobby Inman's uh, uh, request. Well, about six months later, the administration changed and Ronald Reagan came in as president. Uh, William French Smith was the attorney general at the time. And Bobby Inman again went to uh, uh, William French Smith at this time and said, uh, we've got to get this document back from Bamford. It's got all these secrets, you know, and, and we've got to get it back because he's going to write a book and all this stuff. So um, um, now they started taking uh, 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 interest in it, and all of a sudden uh, they decided to, to go after it or go after me. And um, William French Smith assigned one of his uh, top aides at the time to... Uh, to look into it, uh, an obscure official by the name of Ken Starr. Uh, <laughs> so I was his first target uh, long before Monica came along. Uh, so what they did was they called me down to, uh, he was in the background though, it was uh, uh, attorneys in what's known as the Intel uh, Office of Intelligence and Policy Review of the Justice Department that were heavily involved with NSA. And they called me up and asked me to come down to Washington. Well, you know, you just don't go down to Washington and talk to the Justice Department uh, on a whim. So I had an attorney with me. Uh, he was probably the best attorney in Washington on national security issues, Mark Lynch. And we met with them, and they went through about an hour's uh, discourse on, on 
why the document had been accidentally released and it shouldn't have been released, which was all very interesting. And then they, the punchline was, uh, we want it back. And I said, well, you know, it's been given to me by a previous administration. It's not a very good precedent to set, to have a succeeding administration order documents from a previous administration that have been released back. So I said, I'll have to think about this and we may have another meeting. So I, I said, well, uh, later, a few weeks later, I said, well, why don't we have another discussion on this? And I was just going to tell them that I wasn't going to give it back. And this time, um, I said, why don't you guys come to Boston this time instead of me coming to Washington? So they all flew up to, uh, to Boston, and we met at my publisher's office, Hope Mifflin, on Beacon Hill. And I had pur purposefully asked my publisher not to have anything to do with any of this. Um, because of what earlier happened with uh, another author, David Kahn, who wrote The Code Breakers, and NSA succeeded in getting some material deleted from his book. So I didn't want my publisher involved. Anyway, so I met with the, uh, the officials from NSA and, uh, and the Justice Department in the conference room at Hope Mifflin. And uh, it was just going to be, I was going to say, you can't have it back, it's mine. Uh, it was released to me officially, and, and uh, that's the end of it. So they weren't so... <laughs> They didn't take it quite so easily. Uh, they demanded to know who I'd given documents to, how many copies I'd made, who else had seen it. And I said, this isn't even on the gen agenda. You're going to have to call my lawyer in Washington, even if you want to ask me these questions. So they called Mark Lynch, and they said, well, we want to talk to Bamford about this. And on my end of the conversation, I, or my side of the, in Boston there, I could hear him uh, saying um, uh, things like, uh, well, there's the, always the espionage law and all that stuff which didn't sound very encouraging. So uh, Mark Lynch said, uh, well, why don't you put the phone on its side, go wait outside the conference room, and let me talk to Bamford. So they did, and I got on the phone, and, and Lynch said, uh, uh, you know, they're getting way over your head. They could have a warrant for your arrest in their pocket or a subpoena or a summons or whatever. My advice is put the phone back on its side, go out and tell them I want to talk to them again, and, and as they're walking in, you disappear. So. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what I did. I literally disappeared. <laughs> and Mark said, well, I told Bamford that, look, you're way over your head. He doesn't even have a lawyer there, and you guys are just supposed to be having a conversation. These documents have been officially released to him. And so they sat there, and they didn't know whether I was coming back or not, so they sat there for about an hour and then just sort of found their way out of the publishing company and back to Washington, which they were very angry about. <laughs> then they started sending me threatening letters saying, you are currently in possession of classified documents and we demand the return. And we would send a letter back saying, um, under the presidential order on, uh, the executive order on secrecy, once a document's been declassified, it can't be reclassified. I mean, it's very clear. You don't have to have a law degree to sort of understand that. So um, they'd send more letters and we'd just keep sending the same letter back saying, you know, it's been declassified. Um, and so President Reagan got involved, and he decided to change the executive order to say once a document's been declassified, it can be reclassified. <laughs> However, there's another thing called the ex post facto uh, uh, matter. In other words, you can't create a law to punish somebody who's already done something, so it didn't affect me at all. It affects everybody from now on. It's still on the books. Um, so that sort of went away. Uh, let me move on to a few other things here. Um, another thing, when you're looking to get into an agency that doesn't want you to get into, you, you look into, uh, uh, or at least, there aren't many people that actually look into these areas, but they're very profitable. It's a thing called manuscript collections in, uh, in uh, uh, major universities. If somebody famous dies, they leave all their papers someplace, or even not so famous. Um, a lot of times, they don't want their papers destroyed or to go uh, uh, get lost or thrown away or whatever, so they donate them to a university or a museum or something. So that's sometimes a pretty profitable thing to look into. And um, um, I found that the founder of, one of the founders of cryptology, American cryptology, William F. Friedman, who was also one of the founders of NSA, left all his papers to the uh, uh, George C. Marshall Research Foundation down in Lexington, Virginia. And I went down there. The library had, uh, 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 cataloged all his papers. Uh, after he died, they were all moved down there and they were all in nice boxes. And I was only the second person ever to go through those papers. Um, well, the uh, NSA had gone through them before me. Friedman had put them down there in order to get them away from NSA. 
because even though he was basically one of the founders of NSA, he was uh, very upset with the way they, uh, they treated him at the end and the way security was handled. Uh, they raided his house after he retired, thinking he might have had classified documents. They, uh, they did a lot of things, which I won't bore you with right here. But uh, that was the reason he decided to put all his papers down at the George C. Marshall Research Foundation rather than let NSA get their hands on him or even the National Archives. So when I went down there, I was rather upset when I go, went through all the papers and uh, you know, every box I'd find three or four uh, withdrawal slips uh, signed by NSA saying this document's been withdrawn for security reasons or whatever. So I argued with the archivist down there saying, your duty is not to NSA, your duty is to William F. Friedman who left all his papers here. And these documents are not classified. They were basically personal letters written by Friedman after he retired. So we don't, you know, there's no real issue of classification here. Um, anyway, I convinced the archivist and he opened the documents to me. He let me look at them all and, and read them and copy them. And they were, they were uh, very valuable in, in doing my book. And at the same time, he said that uh, if you want, you could take a look at the Marshall Carter papers. And I almost fell off my chair because Marshall Carter had been a former director of NSA. And I had no idea that, he, nobody knew he had ever left his papers there. NSA didn't know he left his papers there. <laughs> but he was a former president of the George C. Marshall Foundation and there was a tax advantage if you leave all your papers to an institution like that. So he got a tax advantage, but then I got all the papers. And he, uh, uh, which made it even better, was the fact that he had previously been the deputy director of the CIA before he became director of NSA. And he had this habit of taking all the unclassified papers in his files with him from both the CIA and the NSA. So I had all these NSA documents in front of me that had never been seen by the censors at, at, at NSA. And a lot of them were very, uh, NSA considered very sensitive because uh, even though they weren't, didn't have classifications on them, the reason some of them didn't have classification was because it was going to the director and they figured the director's not about to, you know, turn them over to the public. So among the papers in there were personal letters from the director of, of the GCHQ, that's Britain's uh, NSA, to the director of NSA. These are handwritten personal letters that thank him for all the work that he's doing, all this kind of things you would never dream of, of ever getting. Um, so I used all that material and it was very, very valuable for doing my book. Uh, NSA had no idea about any of this until the book came out. Once the book came out, they had a team they sent down to the George C. Marshall Research Library to rate it, basically. They pulled all this stuff off the shelf that had been, uh, not only the stuff that had previously been locked up, but even more stuff in order it locked up. They flew out to Denver where, uh, where uh, Pat Carter, the, the former director, lived and basically threatened him with jail if he didn't uh, close his collection, which he immediately did and it was never reopened. Um, as a result of this, there was a large lawsuit filed by the American Library Association, the American Historical Association, the ACLU, a whole bunch of other groups arguing that you can't go into a private library and raid it and take out private papers. Um, and the, it was a complex uh, a resolution to that. They won partly and they lost partly. The, the NSA won partly and the, the uh, parties that were suing won partly. So um, again, that's another area that, that, was, that proved fairly lucrative. And I want to leave a lot of time here for questions too because uh, rather than just sort of dictate uh, to you how these, this works, we could leave, leave some time for, for questions. Um, once, uh, once the book came out, NSA uh, again tried to have me uh, prosecuted. The, um, uh, they said that the, the book by itself was a violation of law because, uh, because I wrote about communications, intelligence, and so forth. The thing was I had about a thousand back notes in the back of the book that showed exactly where everything came from. And there, I didn't bribe anybody, I didn't steal anything. Everything that was in there came from some public source, basically. Um, there were, uh, there was a lot of details on listening posts, where they were, what they're like, how, how, um, how big they are, and all that kind of detail, which NSA was amazed at. But if they looked at the back notes, they would see that um, I carefully went through these obscure documents called, uh, um, uh, there were congressional documents uh, uh, from a committee called the uh, 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 Committee on um, Military Construction or something like that. 
And every time they build something at a military base, uh, they have to fill, the government has to, the army or the navy or whatever, has to fill out a little form. And all those forms were in these, uh, these uh, uh, documents that were, in essence, open to the public. I mean, they were, they were in any government repository. So um, uh, the documents, uh, basically, by reading carefully these documents, you could tell where almost all the listening posts, NSA's listening posts, were located. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if they were going to build something there, if they had to build a chapel or something, or a bowling alley at one of these little listening posts, which are basically military bases, they had to fill out one of these forms. And the form would say uh, how many acres it is, when it was founded, how many people work there, and so forth. So by going through all that material, I was able to put it, um, make sense of it and, and put it into the book. Um, so those are some of the ways that, that I used to sort of write about this agency that uh, um, um, nobody thought you could ever write about. And um, it, it's kind of funny, uh, over the years now, uh, having done that book, and, and then I, I worked in journalism all my career. I was with ABC News for a long time as the uh, investigative producer for the Peter Jennings show. Um, and then I left two years ago to write this new book on NSA. And uh, now NSA has been very friendly to me lately, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, I mean, they've voluntarily given me a tour recently and, uh, and, and other things. So I don't know, I guess if you hit your head against the, the cement wall long enough, they, uh, they take a little pity in you and uh, treat you a little bit better with the second book. So anyway, this new book will have a lot of information in there that comes from NSA and a lot of places that, again, NSA doesn't know where I got the other information from, but it'll all be in the back of the book and you can find out some of these new sources. Anyway, I just wanted to open it up for uh, any questions that anybody might have. Uh, yes, sir. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, the question is basically, what is NSA and why are they doing this? Is that? Or well, I mean, given that they even go after former directors, so what is kind of their soul? You know, the soul of it. What is it? Well, the reason they do this, NSA has um, uh, had a reputation for being ultra secret since its beginning, and they, you know, legitimately, they don't want people to know what codes are breaking or, or th that kind of thing, which you know is legitimate. I don't think I write about which particular codes they're breaking or how they're breaking a code or anything like that. But still, the public uh, is paying a lot of money to this agency. It's the largest intelligence agency on Earth, um, and it's the most expensive. Um, it's far more expensive and far larger than the CIA. Um, and the public has a right to know a little bit about it uh, without giving everything away. So the reason for their secrecy is because they don't want people to, they don't want the Libyans to know that we're breaking the Libyan code or whatever. Um, however, President Reagan decided to give that away voluntarily uh, during his administration. He, he, as justification for bombing Libya, he came on television and said basically that we intercepted uh, Libyan communications and broke their codes. So um, there's a little uh, contradiction to some of that argument. Um, but NSA is just uh, 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 has this reputation, uh, well deserved, for being the most secret agency uh, in the country and. Uh, the fact that there's only been one book ever written about it, I think, uh, um, speaks for itself. Uh, any additional questions? Yes. Uh -huh. Now, it's interesting, in this new book that I just wrote, uh, oh, the, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, in, uh, in doing research, did I find any, uh, any uh, connection between NSA and, and Watergate? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, in, the, in the Puzzle Palace, I didn't write anything about that. I really didn't find any um, uh, much of a connection. But in this book, uh, this new one, I do have a uh, uh, kind of an interesting connection. I've got the actual, um, and this has only just been released recently, and I don't think anybody else has ever really seen it, but I've got the actual uh, Oval Office transcript of Richard Nixon uh, talking, uh, talking about NSA, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, it was in the middle of the, um, the Watergate period, and the, um, uh, the person who, and during Watergate, one of the things that the White House worked on was this thing called the Houston Plan. The Houston plan was this 
very secret plan that was, uh, that was devised to begin turning the U.S. intelligence community inward, uh, uh, using it against U.S. citizens a lot more. And for the first time, the Houston plan gave, uh, gave permission, gave the NSA authorization to begin eavesdropping on U.S. citizens. NSA had been doing it for a long time anyway, but they'd been doing it in total secrecy. And they really welcomed this opportunity because it would give legitimacy to what they'd already been doing for a long time. So um, the director of NSA at the time was very uh, enthusiastic about the whole, um, uh, the whole idea of this Houston plan. And uh, in the Oval Office, uh, uh, the discussion that went on, they said that the director of NSA was the most enthusiastic person of all uh, in, in terms of wanting to turn this uh, technology onto, American, onto the American public. Um, and it was funny because Richard Nixon uh, at the time didn't even know what NSA was. And he started asking questions about what is NSA, what do they do, and this is about three years into his administration, so, um, so it was very revealing in terms of uh, what, what they knew and what they wanted to do at the, uh, at the White House um, in terms of uh, NSA. And I recently interviewed the, the, the current director who'd been there um, uh, a year at He'd been in NSA a year at the time um, when I interviewed him. He's a very, I think he's a very good director, uh, uh, General Hayden. And um, he said that he had never had a conversation with the president up until that time. So, I mean, there's not a lot of direct communications between the director and the president. It's a, NSA still sort of kept kind of uh, um, uh, arm's length away from the White House. Uh, you know, except for its reports and so forth, but in terms of personal contact, it's, uh, there's not a lot of personal contact between the director and the president. It either goes through the director of the CIA or the national security advisor. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the question was whether NSA uh, uh, now looks internally or whether they're, um, uh, and whether they may be cooperating with foreign intelligence agencies. I mean, this is the, uh, the whole echelon question. Echelon is this, uh, uh, it's, uh, from what I've been able to find out, it's basically sort of an uh, internal uh, program, computerized program for, uh, well, let me back up. Basically, what, what NSA does is, uh, it eavesdrops on a lot of communications around the world. It's got to do this as efficiently as possible with the cooperation of other um, uh, cooperating foreign agencies. There's uh, a number of other agencies that cooperate with NSA in their worldwide eavesdropping activity. Uh, they're the uh, eavesdropping co-breaking agencies of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the UK. They're all uh, together in this little agreement called the UK-USA Agreement which came out of World War II. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, um, if you want to eavesdrop on the world, it's much easier if you have cooperation of countries that are scattered around other parts of the world. Uh, so that way the, um, the um, GCHQ, which is Britain's NSA, eavesdrops on much of Europe. Um, Australia eavesdrops on much of the South Pacific and uh, Southeast Asia and so forth. So um, you have all these agencies that all cooperate with each other and they eavesdrop on different parts of the world and then they share their information. Echelon is sort of this uh, mechanism by which they, um, they put in their requests. Uh, the U.S. may want to know uh, about the, the new president of Fiji, for example, um, and Australia would be able to pick that information up. So um, um, Australia would pick it up and then uh, because NSA has requested it through this Echelon system, it gets transferred automatically back to NSA, uh, the results of the eavesdropping, the signals intelligence. Uh, signals intelligence is a polite way of saying eavesdropping. Um, so uh, the question now is whether um, NSA is eavesdropping on U.S. citizens in the U.S. And um, I don't think that they're violating the law today by doing that. Um, and I also don't think that they're putting requests to these other agencies to, to do their own eavesdropping and handing it over to NSA. In other words, asking Britain to eavesdrop on portions of the U.S. to target U.S. citizens from, say, um, uh, having a listening post in Canada or a listening post in, in uh, the Caribbean or something. 
I don't think they're doing it. Uh, I don't know, but from all the indications I've been able to talk to, all the people and all the information I've gotten, it seems like they're obeying the law now. What happened in the meantime, between now and when they were breaking the law, was that um, this was exposed in 1975, NSA's illegally eavesdropping, and there was a new law created called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, under that law, NSA has to now go to a, a court to get a warrant before they eavesdrop on a U.S. citizen within the United States. And uh, that's a, actually, it's a very secret court. Almost uh, very few people know the court even exists. Very few lawyers even know it exists. But it's called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISA court. And the only people that go before it are, are people from NSA and the FBI, basically. And they go in there and they ask for these secret warrants to eavesdrop on U.S. citizens. So that's the procedure NSA has to go through now, and that's the procedure they, uh, I think they, they do go through. And in order to get a warrant, they have to show that the U.S. citizen is involved in either um, um, espionage or terrorism. Uh, those are basically the only two categories that they can eavesdrop on U.S. citizens. And if they, ha they have to present to this judge in the FISA court probable cause that the person's doing it. If they're able to do that, then the um, court issues its warrant, um, and NSA and the FBI can go uh, do, their, do their thing. Uh, the only thing that's really worrying about it is, uh, or one of the things that's really worrying about it, is the fact that the court was created, I think it was 1977, and since that time to the present day, the court has never once turned the government down on a request for a warrant. So you can just, you know, decide what you want about that. Uh, however, if the government does get turned down, there's, uh, there's a, an appeals court. Uh, it's called the Foreign Intelligence or Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Appeals Court, which has the uni unique distinction in the United States of being the only federal court never to have heard a case. <laughs> I mean, since NSA has never been turned down, there's never been a reason to go to the FISA Appeals Court. Um, and if they did go to the FISA Appeals Court, there, there's still another uh, outlet. If the FISA Appeals Court turns them down, they can go to an unbank session of the U.S. Supreme Court for an in-camera hearing, a secret hearing, a, as to whether or not they should be able to get this warrant. So the odds of actually being turned down through all those um, uh, layers is fairly remote. Um, but NSA, um, uh, one thing I usually say to people, you know, who say that the NSA is listening to everybody everywhere at all times, um, I mean, NSA can't even do its own, its, its job correctly. I like NSA and I think it does important work and I'm for increasing its budget and everything, but it doesn't even have enough people or resources to do what it's supposed to do. The, um, uh, for example, uh, one of its principal targets has always been uh, uh, nuclear proliferation and nuclear uh, weapons testing. Yet it totally missed the, uh, the Indian nuclear test uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, totally missed it. Um, and uh, you know, it doesn't have enough resources to do all these things. It's not really trying to listen to every shoe store in Europe. I mean, the Europeans seem to think that uh, uh, all the European uh, corporation c uh, communications are being um, uh, eavesdropped on by NSA. And I just don't think that's the case. Um, I just don't think uh, when, when the National Security Council meets, the first question out of the president's mind is, you know, uh, how, how How's Airbus doing? You know, what's, uh, are we helping uh, Boeing against Airbus? That's not really a big concern. And if it's not a big concern to the senior policymakers in Washington, it's probably not going to be a high priority for, for NSA. Uh, anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your uh, short question. Sorry. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the question was what I'm doing to protect my notes and research from the NSA now. I should have all you guys here, or all your, you guys and ladies, to help me uh, uh, with my computer because it's uh, totally unprotected, unfortunately. Uh, uh, you got all the answers, uh, but I, I, I'm totally un... Uh, it's like driving a car. I know where to put the key in there, and that's about as mechanical as I get. I know how to turn the computer on, but I'm, I'm really an idiot when it comes to encryption and so forth. So I'm not doing anything. I don't really think NSA is coming after me. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years now since I did the Puzzle Palace. 
and they've had plenty of opportunity, and they've had all the Justice Department, and everybody else after me. And uh, you know, I've never once had anybody, you know, follow me down a dark alley or uh, break into my house to steal anything. You know, they can have what they want. The book's going to be out in you know a month and a half, so it's all going to be there anyway. So they may as well just wait and just wait for it to come out. I mean, they can break into my computer if they want, but it's you know it's not going to help them much. Uh, so I don't have any protection, and I'm not really much of a paranoid when it comes to all this kind of stuff. I don't, if people talk to me on the phone, I talk to them on the phone. And I've never once seen anything derogatory ever come about it. I've never had an, uh, an unnamed informant ever, um, you know, disappear on me or anything. Uh, I did this for 10 years for ABC2. I was, like I said, the investigative producer. And a lot of times people want to meet you in a, in a alleyway or some point, you know, but it, most of the time you just sit down in a restaurant and have a chat or whatever. It's not really as melodramatic as it sounds. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, maybe on my, the third of my trilogy here in 20 years from now, I'll come out with the third of my, uh, my, my trilogy on NSA. Maybe by then I'll be um, computer savvy and have some of your uh, computer security information in there. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. I'll take uh, uh, let me ask you, answer you first, and I'll take that question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the question was, uh, what was the timeline between the time I started the book, or I started thinking about it, or whatever, and the time I finished it? Um, it was about it was the Puzzle Palace. It was about three years. Uh, I had thought about it actually before that, but it was just sort of a uh, uh, just a thought a thinking process. I was uh, I actually started doing research on it um, um, and found uh, some of the initial research was going down the Marshall Library and and win, uh, winning uh, against NSA on this newsletter issue. So I that gave me a lot of confidence that I could actually do the project. And and uh, and then I went to the publisher. It was the first publisher I went to, and they liked the idea and. I signed a contract and I got an advance and uh, that was sort of the end of it. And that was about a three-year process. Um, and uh, the, the, my publisher uh, thought I was talking about a novel when I first talked about it because they had never heard of NSA. And, uh, and they, having never written anything before, they gave me a very small advance, uh, uh, figuring I was probably not going to be able to succeed at this, so they weren't going to lose much money if I didn't succeed. And um, and so um, uh, I spent three years on it, and it managed to become a bestseller. And they, I paid back their small advance and made some money on it. So uh, this new book, uh, it was two years, and where the last one I did all on a typewriter. I mean that was really uh, I can't even myself imagine how I did it now. That's that entire book on a typewriter plus uh, a thousand back notes. Um, this time was much shorter because. You know, using a computer, word pro processing, and all that is much a uh, shorter period of time. Uh, however, a lot of the the methods I used in the in the previous uh, uh, the previous time, NSA had, you know, found out I'd gotten information this way, and they closed the door. Uh, so I had to find new ways to get information this time. Um, so NSA is in for some more surprises in, in terms of how I got new information this time. And once the book comes out, uh, you know. If I give one of these things again, I'll I'll explain how I got information for this new book. But I can't do it now because I'll be giving away uh, uh, the uh, information before the book comes out. Um, yes, uh, and s sir, you had a question there. No, I never worked for NSA. I never. I mean, I spent three years in the Navy when during the Vietnam War. Um, uh, I was telling Jack earlier I don't gamble here because of first and only thing I ever won was the uh, very first draft lottery during the Vietnam War. I got number one. So, uh, so I don't gamble after that. Uh, so I spent three years in the Navy and I uh, was just a uh, lowly um, uh, enlisted guy and didn't, uh, you know, didn't have really much access to much. But Well, my first, uh, I'd always been interested in the intelligence. The question was, uh, uh, where did I first learn about NSA and uh, um, 
I'd always been interested in intelligence. Uh, when I was in high school, I read a book uh, called The Secret War by Sacha de Gramont, and he had a chapter in there on NSA, and it was very fascinating, and I just thought it was very interesting. Uh, in the Navy, I'd heard about NSA, did some M NSA stuff I'd been able to see, and I've still never revealed any of that information. Um, after the Navy, I read a book called The Codebreakers by David Kahn, and he had a whole chapter on NSA. So I got more and more fascinated by it, and um, it seemed like a good topic to, to write about. Um, I was uh, trying to find a topic that was unique, and, uh, and so I picked NSA, and, um, and that's the story from there. So uh, yes, sir, uh, there was another question back here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Uh, do I have any sense of NSA's ability for real-time decryption? Uh, no, I really don't. I mean, I, in this new book, I discussed a little bit of NSA's uh, uh, code breaking and, and how they how they attack the the uh, Russian code. There actually is some information in there on that particular topic, but I, I can't really talk about it at this point. But it it deals with. Um, uh, the topic of uh, instantly breaking Soviet codes. Um, so I've got a little bit of information on that. Um, and it's very interesting, I mean, how they, uh, how they go about it. Um, the book, uh, this new book, looks quite a bit at, uh, at how we went about attacking the Russian code from the, the day World War II ended to uh, uh, basically the end of the Cold War. And, uh, and I get a little bit in, into that in the book, but because the book hasn't come out yet, and uh, my publisher gets very angry if I talk about it before it comes out. So, uh, it, it, if you look in there, I'll have some information in there on that. Um, yes, ma'am. Does your book reveal any sensitive information hostile nation Yeah, does the book, uh, either book, reveal any information uh, that may be useful to a hostile nation using it against the United States? Um, when I did the Puzzle Palace, uh, I, there were all these uh, charges by NSA that the world was going to come to an end, civilization was going to cease to exist as we know it, everything was going to, you know, this earth was going to just disintegrate if my book came out. Um, they, they kept, I mean, that was their main, they went before Congress and tried to uh, have Congress um, do something, they went to the Justice Department, they did everything to possibly stop it. Um, the book came out, and there wasn't one change as far as I know. We still won the Cold War. Or the, you know, the Earth didn't come to an end. I think the same thing is true with this one. Now, I don't get into how... Uh, David Kahn's the expert on breaking codes. I'm not. Uh, I couldn't break a code if my life depended on it. Matter of fact, I had lunch with this group called the American Cryptogram Association once, and I almost... It was, I was invited guest, and... Uh, and they had little menus on the table. And uh, the problem was all the menus were in code. <laughs> and uh, I think I was the only one that didn't eat lunch that day. So, <laughs> so I don't get heavily into the technology of how NSA breaks codes. It mostly uh, looks at the uh, issue of eavesdro uh, signals intelligence and, and all that. And, and, um, and the policy issues and the internal workings of NSA and how it works. So I don't think anybody's going to learn anything about how U.S. broke the Libyan code or whatever kind of codes are, are out there. Uh, there's a small amount in there about that, but not very much. So I don't think any foreign country is going to get a lot of knowledge about, about this. I will tell you one funny little anecdote, though. Um, when um, there was a spy case, or a lot of spy cases in the mid-1980s, um, there was a, uh, a Chinese spy case, and I'm trying to remember his name, um, Larry Wu Tai Chin. Uh, he was a, a, a CIA employee for about 20 years, um, but he'd also been spying for the Chinese government, and he was, uh, uh, he was a Chinese, uh, 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 I think he, he may have been born in China or something like that, but... Uh, Anyway, he was uh, discovered in the mid-1980s, and he was arrested. And during the court hearing, um, uh, it was very interesting. During, uh, during the court hearing, he actually took the stand, and 
he said that um, uh, after he left NSA, I'm sorry, after he left the CIA, he told the, uh, the, the Chinese government that he was actually going to get a new job at NSA. Well, he didn't. Uh, he never even applied to NSA as far as I know. He just wanted to retire from the CIA and keep his money coming from the Chinese government. Um, uh, so he told them he was uh, he had gone to work for NSA. Well, the problem was he didn't have any NSA documents to sell them. So what he did was he took uh, uh, certain chapters from my book, translated them into Chinese, and sent them to China. He testified to this in court, and uh, they paid him a fair amount of money for it, or whatever, which I never got any royalties from. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if that helped the Chinese or not. But uh, uh, it was passed to him by Larry. Wu Tai Chin at the time. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. What inspired you to write this uh, second book? Uh, the question was what inspired me to write the second book? Uh, well, there were two things that happened. One of them was my publisher had been after me for a long time to write this new book, and I just kept putting it off. I didn't really want to do it. And then uh, at ABC, I was working at, uh, uh, um, I was the, like I said, the investigative producer. Uh, I was a Washington investigative producer for. World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, and Monica came along. And I hated that story. Um, and so I, rather than spend my days uh, chasing Monica around, I decided to leave and uh, write this new book, which was far more fulfilling. Um, so I may keep writing books, although NSA doesn't have to worry for another 20 years. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, the question was uh, what, what effect uh, widespread uh, encryption has on, on NSA and what the future may hold. Um, that's one of the, uh, the key problems facing NSA right now. One of the, uh, among the problems are this change in technology. Uh, and, and I'll get into that in just a second. The, um, the problems facing NSA right now is uh, uh, among the key problems are the change in technology. For years, NSA have been expert at ringing the, the old Soviet Union with these listening posts that were uh, designed to intercept high-frequency communications because that was what, how the Russian military communicated. The Russian naval and air force and military forces communicated that way largely. And also uh, by putting satellites in space to intercept microwave uh, communications. Um, just to explain how that works, microwaves travel in a straight line. The Earth's curved. So when you have a long line of uh, microwave stations and repeater stations, the, the microwaves eventually end up in space. If you put a satellite out in space, you're basically picking up those, uh, those phone calls. And that's what NSA was doing for, for, a, uh, uh, for a long time. They were concentrating on these technologies. But technologies have shifted, and uh, now there's a lot more on, on fiber optic cable. Uh, which are more difficult to eavesdrop on, and the other uh, difficulty is a lot more. Uh, uh, there's a lot more encryption around. NSA one time had a monopoly on encryption, now it doesn't. And NSA spent a, long, a lot of the 1990s trying to restrain companies from selling powerful encryption overseas, and they pretty much lost at that. So NSA's problem is, is that the, the, they are facing this major problem now, and that encryption is widespread. And uh, it's very cheap, and uh, there's not much they can do about it. So uh, they're they're faced with um, um, uh, trying to just target the the key systems that they want to uh, get information from, and just concentrate their powerful code breaking computers on those systems, or just not get the information. There is one other alternative, though, and that's one area that NSA I think is is moving into uh, NSA and the CIA. Um, one senior, very, very senior intelligence official told me a while back that uh, yesterday's uh, code clerk is today's systems analyst. And uh, this gets more into your area here, and that's the, um, um, the other way, if you can't do it by brute force, if you can't break a code by brute force, uh, then one other possibility is to um, um, find somebody that's working in the in the uh, uh, foreign government or the foreign government um, 
you know, coding agency or whatever, encryption service, and bribe them or um, uh, somehow get them to give them the information, let you get in there and, and plant bugs in their system, whatever, whatever they have to do in order to, to get in through the back door into their encryption system. And uh, in order to do that, the NSA and the CIA have cooperated on a very secret um, uh, new organization uh, call, called the Special Collection Service, which combines sort of the technical side of NSA and the uh, covert side of CIA to go around the world and find ways uh, through the back door into these uh, new systems. And that's sort of the future of both NSA and CIA, is to work together to find these backdoor systems because the front door, through brute force, using powerful computers to, to break it, is uh, getting more and more difficult. Uh, Jack told me I only had five minutes, and that was five minutes ago. But I'll take one, quick, one more quick question if anybody has one. I guess not. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here, and uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Okay, so this room is going to stay the technical track for the rest of the day, and then upstairs, I think almost directly above us, are the uh, two other rooms, <coughs> the deep knowledge and the uh, more technical track. Uh, if you're looking at your schedule and wondering why uh, Rooster is taking a full day for IPsec, um, he's going to start very basically, uh, very basic, and throughout the day it's going to get more and more advanced. Um, so <coughs> if you want to get to the more meat of the pro uh, of the topic, you can get there after lunch, and if you want kind of an overview and ramp up to it, uh, go now. So, very good. Thank you very much. See you around. <laughs>